my name is Sheng Wei and this is my colleague Tek, Tek Chuan. So, so before we begin, I want to start with a demonstration of what we what is an ob, what is the observability supercharger that we built. Our goal here is to simulate a multi-service environment in a Kubernetes cluster. So, in the picture of the stick man you see, that will be you. In the same request, it will be a QR code of a web page that we will share with you later, and it will spawn Kubernetes jobs. Kubernetes jobs that will launch a single request to a database. So here is an example of the job spec that we are using. So you will see here that we added an environment variable called a service name. This is an important thing that will allow us to correlate a packet to a services uh, met metadata. So can I invite you to scan the QR code and send some requests into the uh, the demonstration. So it's, from here you'll see that we have a demonstration of the graph that every one of you is generating. Okay, so as you'll see here, these are all applications that you have sent requests from. And in the top, you'll see that there's, a, there's two MySQL databases. Those are trace events through eBPF that, uh, that the application has generated. So this is what we call a topology map. Thank you for your participation. Okay, so as we have seen earlier, a topology map in our definition is a service that makes requests to, it's a graph of a graphical representation of a service that makes requests to a database middleware like databases, cache, Kafka, or ES. So to have an underst a rough understanding of why we think a map is important, here is how we Here's a layered view of how we understand our infrastructure. So we have our top layers, which is the workloads. So those are the Kubernetes containers, caches, databases, and queues. Next, we have our observability layer, which are the metrics, logs, traces. And then we have our platform layer, which are our thing, the platforms that build on top of the data that, that come before it. So things like data ops, spin ops, AI ops, and DevOps. And all of them were form together to form our, to help us power our business objectives, which we have a, f a few of like database migrations to resource graphs and uh, resource accountability. So for our first example of our dependency graph, why we had something like this is because, uh, actually this, this is wrong. This is wrong. Okay, uh, this is the wrong example. This, the example for this is a database migration. So we had to tag services to whether they are stateful or stateless. So the reason why we had to do something like this is because stateful stated services have require a different operating procedures. So think of a service that writes to a database and you have to do, and you want to share, move the workload to a different database, a different data center. So we will first have to pause the workload in data center A and stop all writes to its middleware, move the workload over, let the data replication catch up to the new uh, data center and then we can unpause all writes and the service can continue its op normal operations. So our next example is a dependency graph. So we use this as a form of incident response tool. So we uh, an issue that we often encountered is that when during when we have incidents, what we, we have uh, is a lack of information for the incident responders. So the in responders are unable to find things like 
what cache does this service use, which database, or where is the cache, which host is the cache uh, deployed at, and which data center. So this is important to us because we can instantly see from a graph that the dependencies will show a abnormal metric to determine whether that might be a possible root cause. And for, for resource accountability, which we, I touched on earlier in our business objectives, it is something like how do you attribute cost to an organization? In order for you to attribute cost first, you need some to attribute ownership of a resource to a service. However, because we often have many migrations, it's very, very hard for us to accurately determine uh, which organization a resource belongs to because a resource might move across organizations, a service might move across organizations, all of which can lead to there being ambiguous ownership of a resource which greatly affects how we can do cost or attribution. So now that I have touched, roughly touched on our business objectives, this is a rough overview of how our containers ecosystem looks like. So first, traffic enters our data centers through the layer four and layer seven load balancers onto our front services, which will translate HTTP into our RPC frameworks. From there, the, the RPC framework will handle the various work, the various requests, and then our ports will run API services, queue consumers, or cron jobs across 10 AZs. Yeah. So here's a few different ways that we tried to implement something like a topology map. So the first way is we try to deal, for, deal with the issue from a platform workflow perspective. So for all new clusters, we enforced that they needed to have mandatory bindings of a resource into the, into, onto the service. And for existing clusters, we had to do data gathering from the service owners in order to link the resource back to the service. What we learned doing this was that the data collection for existing clusters took way too much time and we had some tight timelines for our projects. But the main issue was that it was still possible for data drift to happen when the service or resource moves across organizations again. So next we tried to implement it from a client side perspective. So we had common libraries teams that will manage the SDKs for our middle west. So like we have database libraries, red cache libraries or Kafka libraries. And from there, we will get the help from the platform teams to implement some instrumentation into the SDKs to help us in adding some metadata onto a resource. However, what we learned from this was also that it was very hard to roll out because the initial release took a few months. We had to do massive code changes across 13 business lines and, there were, and because we wanted to do it in a safe manner, we had to roll it out in a canary manner as well. But the main issue was with this was also that we could not achieve full coverage as not all teams will use the internal libraries that the platform teams built. Some teams will opt to use their own libraries. So at long last, we decided to venture into eBPF. This was an experiment where we wrote an eBPF script to script for all Connexis calls out of going out of the service. It will extract the domain name from the syscall and and from the and from the PID's environment variables. It will extract the service name through environment variables that are set by our container orchestrator. So what we learned from this was eBPF was a good way forward to help us in our objectives, but it also exposed an issue in that intercepting DNS calls will only expose a, a relation to a resource, but it did not prove an ownership of a resource to a service, which meant that we had to go one step further and it was, and that was to start intercepting layer seven packets. So now I'll hand my time to take turn to Share on the layer seven. Okay, so 
um, we have heard a lot from Shen Wei with the attempts that uh, we have tried to solve the problem. So um, with that in mind, let's set some objectives uh, for this problem. So first of all, um, the objective that we set is for the solution to be non-intrusive because we have learned that making code changes over thousands of code bases is not really a solution forward. And the data that we, we are sniffing should also be highly reliable so that uh, the data cannot be easily tempered and has high trustworthy, and that the solution should also be scalable in the long term. So throughout this uh, term, the non-intrusive uh, term immediately rings a bell on eBPF as uh, Sean has mentioned. So we started to investigate and explore into the open source community to try and find whether we can see there's any existing solution. And through this solution, we found a project called Pixie. So Pixie is an open source observability tool for Kubernetes application. And it observed the high level state of your cluster and also drew down into the more detailed views. So unfortunately, the outcome is that we did not utilize Pixie in, in Shopee, but uh, because we faced some limitation that I will share. So um, part of the limitation is that the workloads have to be pure Kubernetes port, which means that all your applications must run in Kubernetes clusters. But uh, this, however, not the case in Shopee. So there are actually many legacy systems uh, that are running in non-Kubernetes clusters in Shopee. And I strongly believe that this is actually a common limitation faced by many companies. So, and especially in this rapidly uh, changing technology environment. And also the problem that we faced was that uh, the to use Pixie, the minimum Kubernetes requirement uh, for the version has to be version 1.21 and above. And for us, upgrading Kubernetes version quickly is also not that simple of an operation. So we do acknowledge that Pixie is a great solution which meets our objective, but we had to dive deeper to unravel the uh, magic behind Pixie. So through the investigation and exploration, we found that Pixie's uh, core uh, logic is actually running in this uh, component called the Pixie Edge module. So the Pixie Edge mo module is actually the daemon set deployed onto the uh, Kubernetes uh, agent and uh, performing protocol passing. So taking the Pixie Edge module as an inspiration, we extracted a protocol passing solution, also known as Sterling in the repository. We took the inspiration directly from Sterling and rewrote the implementation uh, from C++ into a simple Python BCC script. And there we have it, a simple Python BCC script that performs protocol passing deployed as a daemon set onto almost every production server in Shopee. So let me share more insights on how this works. So this is actually the overall uh, architecture solution for um, the observability super charger. So um, first of all, the eBPF BCC script actually attaches the uh, kernel probes as mentioned in the slide. Now, following on, whenever an application sends a, a connection request as what you guys did with the QR code earlier, for example, a MySQL DSN request, we only intercept the AFINet and AFINet 6 uh, packet uh, in the kernel, and all other requests are, are basically ignored. And we extract the file descriptor from this connection and store it into the PPF hash. So whenever the write sys call is triggered, we actually look up the PPF hash uh, with the FD of the connection. And if the file description, sorry, file descriptor exists within the BPF hash, we copy the buffer using the BPF macro and set it as a perf output. So whenever the connection closes, then we also have to release the file descriptor from the BPF hash. So the user space then receives the buffer data that we have uh, copied from the perf output. And then we perform protocol passing um, attempts on these uh, basic connections. So uh, here's also a shout out to the community for having great documents for all these uh, protocols uh, uh, documents like MySQL, Kafka. So after successful decoding, the data is then sent to the web server for collection. So on a side note, we actually use a producer subscriber design pattern on the web server to prevent overkilling on our database. So extending beyond the eBPF solution, we actually sync all these connection data from our database to our data warehouse using real-time ingestion for further processing. So in our use case, we actually perform OLED processing in the data warehouse. We map various found connection domain port names such as Kafka topic database name to various infrastructure related data to create an observability map that you have seen earlier. So finally, it's very simple to run the solution. All we need is a Linux OS server, a simple HTTP web server, a relational database, and if OLED processing is in your consideration, obviously you need a data warehouse. 
So what did we then achieve at the end of the day? So what used to require hundreds of man hours to perform data tagging, which still fetch inaccurate and incomplete observability data, we now achieve it in real time as we speak now. We expose over a million um, <coughs> traceable middleware database connection, over 10 million traceable DNS connection, and over 5 million verified database and middleware uh, usages from applications. So this data then help us today to make key decision making in data center migration, decommissioning, cost center alignment and budgeting, as well as our disaster recovery project. So the key takeaway for today will be that eBPA is lightweight, it's scalable, agnostic to system environment for our solution, and can be further empowered with data ops. So this is what we are sharing for today, and uh, we are open for questions. Thank you.